live from the Aspen Ideas Festival in Aspen, Colorado. Brian there with you on WNYC. Good morning, everyone. And it's really morning here, two hours earlier than in New York. We are doing a breakfast session for a room full of about 100 people who are so dedicated to discussing ideas that they got up and came out here at 8 o'clock in the morning, Mountain Time. So thank you to our live audience. And again, we thank the festival and the Aspen Institute for co-producing this with us and for their generous support to make our trip here possible, to bring you lots of people we would not otherwise be able to meet at all, probably, no less have breakfast with in the same room and share ideas. And this is no continental breakfast. This is an intercontinental breakfast. We are lucky enough to have people from three continents together on this Aspen stage to discuss the world economic order nearly a year after the bank meltdown now. Raghuram Rajan, economic advisor to the president of India, former chief economist of the International Monetary Fund, and a University of Chicago professor is here. He was one of the people who warned that at least part of this meltdown was possible. We'll get to that. Gerard Kleisterly, CEO of Royal Philips Electronics, the biggest electronics company in Europe, and of course a major presence in the United States as well. David Wessel, Wall Street Journal economics editor, who also have a book coming out this fall about Ben Bernanke. And Roger Ferguson, president and CEO of the financial services company TIAA Cref, which serves millions of Americans working mostly in academia and other nonprofits. Full disclosure, I have retirement plan money with TIAA Craft through WNYC. Uh, Roger Ferguson is also a member of President Obama's Economic Recovery Advisory Board, and he has been Vice Chairman of the Board of Governors at the Federal Reserve Board. So welcome to all of you. Thanks very much for sharing this intercontinental breakfast session. And this is an ideas festival, so let me begin with a, th a thought experiment. Harad Kleisterly, if you were starting an electronics firm today, would you start it in the United States? And if not, why not? Well, we, we covered a, a broad range of electronics. Um, if, if you say electronics in a strict sense, then, then people think of Asia. Uh, but actually, uh, for us, electronics is, to a large extent, uh, medical equipment, uh, of which we produce a good deal uh, in America with great success, because these are complex systems that, that require an infrastructure that can supply to it, that require uh, well-trained, well-educated uh, employees, and those you find uh, at the moment, uh, fortunately, uh, out of a good U U.S. university system as well as in Europe. So high-end complex things uh, we do, and, and I would continue to do, in Europe and in the United States. Of course, there's an upcoming Asia um, that will get its fair share of it, uh, but it's not such that all manufacturing necessarily has to go to Asia. And listeners, we've posted this question on our Facebook page. You can also comment at WNYC.org. Click on Brian Lehrer Show. If you were starting any kind of a business today, where would you start it? What country? Those of you with knowledge in business, knowledge of the world economy, maybe you want to post on that to WNYC.org. Click on Brian Lehrer Show. Uh, we will be taking some of those posts on the air today. You can also see our Twitter feed and Flickr photos from Aspen, by the way, at WNYC.org. Click on Brian Lehrer Show. Raghur Rajan, same question, basically. What if you were starting an investment bank? It's a global economy. You can start up anywhere you want after you jump through the right hoops, I guess. Where are you starting a new investment bank today? Well, I'm going to give the economist's answer. It depends. <laughs> but, but really, here, here's the reason why. I, I think what's happening in the world is that demand, which was provided by industrial countries, is slowly, over the next four or five years, going to shift to some of the emerging markets, uh, certainly in Asia, perhaps Latin America also, um, Eastern Europe. Uh, and, and this will imply lots of opportunities in servicing that demand. Uh, being close to your customer is usually a benefit. And you asked me about a service industry. My sense is right now emerging markets underprovide these services. You don't have big advertising firms. You don't have big law firms, consulting firms. But as demand, as people who buy move to those countries. You're going to have more of these kinds of services provided there. So if I were to s start a service firm now, the opportunity lies there. However, the, uh, the institutions are here in industrial countries. And so it, it's a, it's, it's, it's a toss-up. Do I prefer where the opportunities are in terms of demand? Do I prefer where it's easier to open up because the rules, regulations, contractual structures, all that are in place? 
And, and, and my sense is, uh, is uh, you know, pretty much anywhere at this point would be fairly exciting. Roger Ferguson, you run a financial services company that invests hundreds of billions of dollars, including in government bonds. So if I'm in a TIA, a CREF bond fund, where are you looking to invest my money right now? More inside the United States or more outside than a year ago? Uh, the reality is uh, right now we're looking both places for reasons that Raghu has pointed out. Uh, the U.S. has, without a doubt, uh, the deepest, most liquid capital markets. We've got a uh, great deal of transparency. Uh, TIA Craft continues to push on issues of corporate governance. They have become a forefront concern. But I would say even in that sphere, we're probably ahead of other countries. On the other hand, as Raghu has pointed out, there are plenty of growth prospects elsewhere. Uh, the markets are not yet as deep and liquid. And so our, our bias in terms of investment has been uh, U.S., but with a clear focus in on global opportunities. David Wessel, Wall Street Journal economics editor. Help us process these answers. Everyone's being interesting but diplomatic. What's interesting to you here so far? I thought you were going to ask me where in the world would I start a newspaper, and I was going to, I was going to say, nowhere. do something else. <laughs> uh, look, I think, that, uh, I think that there are a couple of things here. One is, China is clearly one of the world's most interesting places to be a business. And if you thought you could actually keep your profits, and we're sure of that, there would be a lot of people investing in China who aren't. So the reason that people invest, in, as Raju said, in countries like the United States or even in Europe for all its current problems is that they have some confidence that if their businesses work out, they won't be expropriated or, or taken over by the government. So it, it is a very interesting uh, juxtaposition of risk, which is less in the United States, and reward, which is probably more in some of the fast-growing emerging markets. Here at the Ideas Festival yesterday, Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google said the United States would lead the world out of the global recession largely because of our university system and our culture of innovation. Here's a short excerpt. I personally think it has to do with our university systems. Um, ultimately, the reason these things occur in America has a lot to do with the culture of America. Americans are optimists. They are innovative. They are creative. And they believe in the future. Harald Kleisterly from Philips uh, from the Netherlands. How much do you agree with that? Um, I would say I, I partly do agree. Um, uh, there is a good university system. U.S. Uh, citizens tend to be optimistic. Um, but I think that a big part of the recovery also will have to come and will come from Asia. If I look at our company at the moment, uh, our revenue is roughly split a third, a third, a third across uh, Europe. Uh, the U.S. and, and emerging economies, uh, pre predominantly uh, Asia. If I project that a few years forward with the, with the current outlook for uh, uh, global GDP growth in the different territories, in, in four or five years' time, uh, more than half of our revenue will come from Asia. Um, so I think that, that Asia will be uh, a big contributor to, uh, to economic recovery simply because uh, the demand is there, the growth is there. And um, relating to the optimism that Eric Schmidt was uh, referring to, um, that is very, very, very present in Asia. In Asia, uh, parents firmly believe that their children will be better off. Um, that is to some extent still the case in the United States. Uh, that is not the case in Europe. In Europe, uh, the average European thinks that their children will be worse off than they were. And I think that's the pattern of, uh, that will drive economic recovery as we're going to see it. Do governments in Europe or does the EU need to address that attitude oh, yeah. in some way? How? Um, they, they, they try hard. Um, for years they have been uh, trying to follow, uh, you could say, the American model, uh, focus on innovation, focus on knowledge economy, um, but it's a hard act, uh, in particularly because, uh, as you see now in the crisis, um, there is not really a Europe. Yes, we have an EU, we have a Euro, uh, but when it comes to uh, supporting the economy, it's back to national governments trying to back what they perceive to be a national economy, and there is no national economy. Uh, and uh, to our audience members here at the Aspen Ideas Festival, we invite your participation here. Uh, some of you raised your hands before when I asked who owns a business. If you were starting a business today, where would you start that business? 
If you want to speak, or if you have any other question for our panelists, raise your hand, and we have two people with microphones who will come around and, and get an idea of what you might want to ask, and we'll start going to some of you soon. Uh, Raghu Rajan, same question. You want to react to Eric Schmidt from Google? What, is, what does that mean for India, where you advise the government? Is there a developing culture of innovation and universities to rival the United States, or don't you agree with him that those are the two big things to look at in terms of who will lead us out of the recession? Uh, I, th those are two big things uh, for the medium term, not for who will re lead us out of the recession. I think the U.S. will lead us out of the recession, but for a different reason. I think the extent of stimulus in the U.S., both monetary and fiscal, is unimaginably large. And it's large because of a deficiency in the U.S. The U.S. has weak safety nets. If you lose a job, you lose your health care, you, 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 you really are in a bad strait, unlike in Europe. And so you let people know that you're angry. And I think congressmen are hearing this all over the place. And therefore, the willingness to pull out the stops in terms of the extent of stimulus, the first stimulus package, no, longer, no sooner was the ink dry than they were talking about a second stimulus package. Interest rates are at zero. So I think all this will ensure that the US will drive the world. It's also the biggest economy. It's going to drive the world out of the recession. I think in the medium term, forces like the greater productivity, the intellectual capacity, all that will help. And this is where I think Asia, over time, uh, it takes a long time to set up good universities. China is trying very hard. India hasn't got its act together as yet. But this will happen, and they will rival the US in terms of intellectual property. But that's some time to come. So Roger Ferguson, uh, on the culture of innovation, that involves taking risks. You're on President Obama's Economic Recovery Advisory Board. And the president is now focused on reducing the amount of risk that financial institutions, at least, take after the craziness of credit default swaps and other exotic derivatives and the easy credit being extended to consumers for mortgages and credit cards and everything. But these derivatives were seen by the industry as forms of innovation. They've used that word many times. TIAA CREF, I'm sure, invests in kinds of securities that didn't even exist a generation ago. So is there a risk of stifling innovation with the new rules the president is promulg promulgating in the name of reducing risk? Uh, Brian, that's <clears throat> obviously a very good question. Let me uh, first, though, go back to Eric's question, if you allow me. Please. Because as the president of TI Cref, I represent the uh, retirement savings of 3.5 million Americans, many of whom are in higher education. You have a vested interest in this, literally. <laughs> well, we have a vested interest. We spend a lot of time on university campuses, and I've come to the conclusion that Eric came to, that one of the long-term strengths of America is uh, our focus on education. However, I would point out that there are some risks there uh, that Eric did not discuss. Clearly, we have risks in the K-12 system, which is the major feeder system into higher education. I think very few of us are happy with the state of public education overall though the administration is working to fix that. And obviously, in higher education, one of the things we have to worry about is to make sure that our borders are still open to allow long, young scholars to come here and be trained, and hopefully many of them will stay here. And so I agree with Eric uh, on the long-term value. There are some risks. There's, now, a, there's a policy question there that Eric Schmidt actually brought up in his talk uh, with respect to students who come from abroad and study in the United States and then their student visas run out and they're forced to leave. And he says that's the exact opposite of what we should be doing. Here we have scientists, PhDs, engineers, everybody. We should be saying, please stay here. We're going to give you money to stay here or something instead of kicking them out, which is exactly not in the United States' interest. You agree with that? I would agree with that. Uh, the standing joke among some people in higher ed is that along with a diploma for your PhD, you should also get a green card. And I, that obviously is, is not true public policy, but a response to the issue that Eric was raising. On the issue of innovation and risk taking, uh, there's no question that in financial markets uh, in many institutions, fortunately a lot in my own, uh, the risk taking got a bit out of hand. One of the things that we have to recognize though is that financial products are an area of dramatic innovation. They are a way that the US will lead the world forward. They have on balance uh, been a source of wealth in the United States economy. But as with any innovation, we all have to learn how to use them wisely and smartly. And for many of the innovations that were introduced, they were introduced at a time of very, very benign economic circumstances that proved not to be long-lasting, and therefore some internal weaknesses uh, came forward. But I think the major lesson from this is that we, as you've indicated in your question, must not stifle innovation financial services, 
but we must remind the leaders of financial services that risk and reward go together, and we must remind everybody of something that our mother said, which is that if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. David Wessel, Wall Street Journal Economics Editor. Briefly on this before we need to go to a break, then we'll start taking uh, comments and questions from the members of our audience here. Uh, is there risk in regulating risk, and is it something we should be concerned about if we value our culture of innovation? I think we have to guard against complacency. We tried that, and it didn't work very well. Uh, we cannot count on being the world's center of innovation without working at it. I think Roger's point bears repeating. If we have a substandard K through 12 system, how can we have the world's leading higher education system 20 or 30 years from now? And secondly, I think it's an open question whether this whole episode will make us as a nation more risk averse. Will the result of this be people who save more? We hope so. But will it be one where it's harder to get venture capital, where people are more afraid to take risk? where the government is less willing to let people take risk? I think these are big questions that we're going to have to grapple with in the last, next couple of years as we fix the system that is so badly damaged. All right, listeners, you can post your comments on, uh, on this question to our website too, wnyc.org. Click on Brian Lair Show. Are you concerned at all that we regulate risk too much going forward if we're going to lead the world out of the recession with our culture of innovation in the United States. WNYC.org, click on Lair, Brian Lair Show. We'll read some of your comments on the air as we continue here at the Aspen Ideas Festival. A reminder that coming up next hour here from Aspen, we have the U.S. Education Secretary, Arnie Duncan, to start the next hour. Brian Lair on WNYC from Aspen. More to come. Great start, guys. Thank you very much. Really interesting. All right, you can all have meaningful conversations in 60 seconds. Brian Lehrer on WNYC from the Aspen Ideas Festival. You can also see our Twitter feed and Flickr photos from Aspen at WNYC.org. Click on Brian Lehrer Show, and you can uh, post to our Facebook page or our comments page your answers to the question, is the United States at risk of regulating risk too much? And if you were starting a business in any country in the world, where would you start it? Our intercontinental breakfast here in Aspen with our guests from three continents, Harad Kleisterly, CEO of Royal Phillips Electronics, the biggest electronics company in Europe, with, of course, a major presence here as well. David Wessel, Wall Street Journal economics editor. Roger Ferguson, president and CEO of TIAA Cref, the financial services company. And Raghuram Rajan, economic advisor to the president of India, former chief economist of the International Monetary Fund and a University of Chicago professor. And let's go to a question from our audience here at Aspen. Who's got it? Is it over there with you? Yes. Hi. Hi. How are you? Um, well, there's a voice missing here. Um, there's, uh, as a woman, um, if you, you can't look at the world equally as the opportunity for business. So for that reason, I would say the United States or Canada is where I would start uh, if I was going to start another business. For the access to capital, for support, and for opportunity. 
who wants to react to that? Um, Ra Ra Ragu, do you want to you want to take that on? Well, um, I was just going to say I I think that. Uh, one of the nice things about starting a business is you don't have the vested interests of the old hierarchy uh, to deal with. And so it seems to me that uh, starting a business is particularly attractive for women. And I have to say there are lots of women entrepreneurs in India. There's one extremely successful biotech entrepreneur. Uh, I, I, I think uh, entrepreneurship amongst women in emerging markets is also increasing. I wouldn't dismiss that. Do you want to talk about, do you want to follow up maybe and talk about some countries where you'd be afraid to invest, or where do you want to go with this? Well, I mean, I, th I think it is increasing that women can start businesses other places, but it's still, it's not the norm, and it's still very difficult. I do a lot of work in Asia and Southeast Asia, and there are women who are starting businesses, but it's, it's not the norm, and it's harder and harder for them. They don't have the access to capital. It's not as easy. There's not the infrastructure. There's not the community of other women. Um, and I think it's, uh, it, is, it is changing, but I don't think it's there yet. I really don't. Don't Kiva and other businesses like that and the microloan organizations, uh, David Wessel, maybe you're familiar with this, target business, uh, target women-owned businesses in particular around the emerging, emerging world, David Wessel? Well, oh, yes, the, the microfinance movement, which was born basically by Mohammed Yunus targeting women in in the communities where he worked. Um, I think that's at, a, at one end of the spectrum. Very poor women trying to help them get uh, independent from their husbands in some cases and help them to get uh, s started in something that can build savings and to get peer support. I think that's a very different issue from the kind of entrepreneurship with, that Raghu mentions about starting a biotech company. And I think there clearly are countries in the world, I mean Saudi Arabia comes to mind, where they are denying themselves the the fruits of their own people by keeping women down. And uh, Larry Summers, when he was at the World Bank, uh, talked a lot about how much the return would come from educating women in emerging markets. Question over there, hi. Uh, we talked extensively about the exceptionalism of American universities, but we haven't talked about the fact that the access to that system is actually decreased because of two major factors. One is the cost of education has outpaced inflation for about 20 years and actually twice as expensive on a relative basis. And number two, and especially among our elite universities, the size has remained stagnant. So access to this system has actually decreased. Roger Ferguson, that seems up your alley. Yeah. Certainly, uh, your issue around access is extremely important. One would note that even among some of our most elite institutions, they have used their wealth in order to make their universities more accessible. Uh, one can think about a number of places that have so-called need-blind admission. Uh, Harvard itself uh, has made some significant strides in that area. But observing those things does not change the fundamentals that you observed, which is that the cost of higher education has gone up quite dramatically. Uh, I would say one of the interesting outcomes of this current crisis is I believe that universities will sharpen their pencils and work very, very hard to maintain much more discipline uh, around costs. The second that we've seen is uh, the U.S. government itself has stepped in as part of the stimulus package. They've created uh, more opportunities through so-called Pell Grants. And finally, just as a matter of public policy, the issue of access and accessibility is clearly one that's on the table. So I think you put your finger on something that's important. I think some signs of improvement are there, but obviously there's more that we're going to have to do. Raghu and David, you both want to get in on this. Raghu? Um, um, just quickly. Um, while some of it might look like the universities are padding their, you know, paying higher salaries for no reason, and therefore costs are going up, the real truth is that there's some phenomenon called skill bias technical change going on in the U.S. As a result of technological change, uh, more and more value is being put on higher degrees. Now, universities are full of people with higher degrees. All of them have PhDs, and therefore the amount you're paying them is going up because in the rest of the economy is going up. And the sad truth is supply of these higher degrees has not kept up for the reasons Roger talked about earlier, that we aren't producing enough people going into the universities who are then able to you know, become teachers, uh, et cetera, and therefore keep the cost of education down. In the long run, in my view, the key to doing that is fixing K-12, which will be the feeder system into the universities and ensuring the access that you're worried about, which I think is important. And by the way, we'll be talking with Arnie Duncan here at Aspen 
on the show next hour about exactly that, David Wessel. I think it's a mistake to use the word college and immediately think of University of Chicago, Harvard, and Yale. I mean, access to higher education in the U.S. is largely through the community college system. And I think it's way undervalued, despite the fact that it's getting more attention, because those are the very flexible institutions, some of them excellent, some of them awful, many of them flooded with students now and underfunded because of the way of state budget problems. And that is, for many people, particularly immigrants or people who don't have access to, to four-year colleges, that they're getting on the escalator, and it is essential to our prosperity that we get more people educated, but they're not going to go to all the Yale, Harvard, and University of Chicago. From our webpage, uh, CH from Staten Island writes, common sense would suggest, where do I want to start a business? Anyone starting a new business should consider if they want to live where the venture is and how quickly they can adapt to the surroundings. After all, if it is a success, you might want to stick around. And if it fails, you may well be stuck there. <laughs> and um, Stephanie from Brooklyn writes, I do not hear any distinction being made between business and technological innovation, which is based on actually producing things, and financial innovation, which as far as I understand it, has meant gambling on getting something for nothing. There's a difference between risking on a bet and risking on a project. I see heads nodding. And I think we have a venture capitalist in the audience who wants to speak. Sir. Uh, hi, Pascal Levinson, venture capitalist from San Francisco. I wanted to ask you, the panel, to please relate to this discussion about innovation uh, and venture capital to the systemic liquidity crisis that we're experiencing in Silicon Valley. As you know, in the 90s, before the bubble, the, we were averaging 130 IPOs per year for emerging growth companies. The statistics just came out to this morning. Uh, first half of the year, only three venture-backed IPOs, and we've only been averaging 44 IPOs uh, in the uh, decade of the 2000s here, and there are over 5,000 venture-backed companies that have not had exits, either M&A or IPO, that have been funded since 2004. So we've got a, a, a serious liquidity problem here, and if, you know, TIAA CREF is being impacted by this, every institution has been invested in, on a four to six year liquidity cycle. It's broken, how do we fix it? Roger Ferguson, you want that? <laughs> Looks like I've got it, so I'll take you it. You don't have to have it. <laughs> no, I'm happy to answer it. Look, I think the reality is that we're trying to find as a society a steady state in the world that you occupy, which is venture capital. I'm not sure that all of those ventures that were funded in the 1990s withstood the test of time, as we well know. Uh, we saw in 2000 to 2001 uh, a bubbling, bubble that was burst, the tech bubble, indicating that, in fact, perhaps there was too much liquidity going into a small number of high-tech concepts. On the other hand, I fully agree with you. What we have now is also not sustainable. It reflects the, the deep recession that we have and the fact that this is a financial recession as well as a real economy recession. I think coming out of this, we will have to get back to a steady state, somewhere between the go-go excessive years of the 90s and the very, very uh, slow years that we're dealing with right now, because it is in the long run an important part uh, of American growth. The second point I'd make uh, is obviously that there's risk associated with any of these things, and the exit is part of the risk that one has to factor in, uh, for sure. Uh, and so the reality, as you went all well know in venture capital, is the vast majority of ideas don't pan out, a small number of ideas pan out very, very well, and I think that uh, nature of inequality in venture capital will not change, even though we're currently confronting a liquidity drought in that area. Roger, as a follow-up, here's a question that somebody wrote in about how you assess risk today, and it says, um, when you make bond investment decisions, given uh, what bad predictors bond ratings prove to be, I'd like to know how you're doing it now. Do you still use the big three rating agencies? Will you only do AAA, where they used to be buying, where you used to be uh, willing to buy AA, et cetera? President Obama's financial regulation proposals didn't really touch the rating agencies. Are you disappointed in that? Well, at TIA CREF, we never relied on the rating agencies. We always did independent fundamental analysis. I am proud to say that we, broadly speaking, uh, avoided subprime because we looked at that asset class. We didn't understand the pricing. We weren't sure we understood the uh, stream of repayment capabilities. And so I think the reality, as shown by TIA CREF, is that you can have a very large financial services firm. We invest nearly $400 billion of other people's money, including Brian's money, based on fundamental analysis. And I think that is an area 
that all financial services firms are going to have to return to. Full disclosure uh, once again, and I guess all of us at WNYC who are in that plan are uh, grateful for the stability of TIA craft right now <laughs> relative to some other things. Um, and with us, if you're just joining us, uh, here live at the Aspen Ideas Festival is Roger Ferguson, President and CA CEO of TIAA Craft, who is just speaking, David Wessel, Wall Street Journal Economics Editor, Harard Kleisterly, CEO of Royal Phillips Electronics, the electronics firm, biggest one in Europe, and Raghu Rajan, Economic Advisor to the President of, uh, the Prime Minister, I should say, of India, former Chief Economist of the IMF and a University of Chicago professor. Did anyone else want to react to the venture capitalists? Question, David Wessel? I, I think only that it illustrated in response to one of the questions that you got by email that it's very hard to have a healthy real economy without having a healthy financial sector. And one of the reasons our economy is so sick now is our financial system, while it may be out of uh, off the death list, is still in critical condition. Harard, um, how's Phillips doing in getting credit right now? Is there a credit crunch still that's affecting your company? Um, there is a credit crunch, but it's not affecting our company because we, uh, we went into the crisis with an extremely strong balance sheet, uh, so we, we don't need money. Uh, we were smart enough to, to refinance what we had to finance uh, early in the cycle, uh, long term, uh, at good rates. So at the moment, uh, I think to some extent we're even benefiting because uh, uh, where necessary uh, we can support our long-standing customers uh, getting through the credit crunch um, with uh, the financial strength that we have. Uh, but certainly we see the credit crunch, particularly in Europe. Uh, all the banks have to um, increase their, uh, their ratios, they have to strengthen their balance sheet. So while the governments are pouring billions into the banks, uh, that stays in the balance sheet and doesn't get back into the economy yet. And so we will have uh, quite some time before uh, the financial system also in Europe will be in a situation where it, it can start to support the economy again. How is this affecting your planning for the future at Philips? Well, to the extent that, that um, uh, the view we've taken uh, when this, this crisis unfolded was that um, in, in many of the developed economies, the financial sector uh, was a fairly large part of the economy and, and would implode at least with 30%. Uh, so, f from the start, um, I've taken the view that uh, the crisis would be deep, uh, and the recovery would be slow, uh, and, and therefore for quite some time uh, we would be at much lower levels uh, of revenue uh, in the global economy than we had experienced uh, previously. Um, so, very early on we started to adapt uh, structurally our cost, take our cost levels down, um, and try to find the right balance between managing your cost and going after the opportunities in the market that, that still are there. What about your employees? Have you laid off many people? Um, we have to. We have had to lay off people. That's, that's always a, a very painful exercise. Um, and, uh, How many people? What percentage of your workforce? Well, I, I, I don't have a percentage there because we, we, we've started to do that already at the back end of 2007 when we saw the early signs of consumer weakness appearing in the United States. Um, so when you do it early, you can do it gradually, then it's less painful. And because we've done it in a very responsible uh, way also towards our employees, which the employees see, um, throughout that process, we've even been uh, able to uh, enhance uh, our employee engagement uh, to one of the highest levels that we have had in history. David Wessel, what do you think is permanent here? I mean, this was a 100-year event. This is not your everyday dip and recovery, even if the worst of the worst has been avoided as people are saying now we're not going into a Great Depression, apparently. Is culture going to be different? Are consumers going to behave very differently for decades now as compared with the last 30 years? Are investors? Well, permanent is an awfully long time. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think anything is permanent, but I think that for the next couple of decades, it is likely that consumers will be different. American consumers will be less uh, spendthrift and more thrifty. That means that the rest of the world will have to find a way to rely more on domestic demand and less on selling to the United States. I think that we are entering in the U.S. an era of a great skepticism of the market. That we, the idea that if rich, sophisticated people were in the game and had their own money exposed, that they would keep the game honest and prevent the poker table from turning over, turned out to be wrong. So we're entering a period where there will be more faith and more reliance on government regulation for better or worse. Uh, Harad, I want to come back to you on that with respect to Phillips. Will it affect what business you're even in 
because I think of you as a maker of flat screen TVs and medical equipment and things like that, but I met one of your employees on the plane out here, and she said she's a lifestyle coach. I don't even know what that means. But is Philips in the lifestyle coaching business, and is that a response to the change? Uh, well, as a matter of fact, we are. Um, there's a little thing that I, I carry around in my pocket, uh -oh. which uh, registers my movements, um, so, and I plug it into the computer at night so I can see how much activity during the day I, I had. Uh, it's one of our new ventures. It's uh, getting into, uh, into real life, I think, in a fairly successful way. And it's, it's one of the attempts. I mean, we have chosen for our company uh, looking at the demographics. Uh, growing population, aging population, more need for health care, uh, affordable health care. And, and one of the ways to keep health care affordable is to prevent people from uh, getting ill by focusing at a healthy lifestyle. Wait, wait, what is, can I see that, that thing? Can I take that out of your pocket? It looks like a little flash drive from no. here, but what oh, are we is, looking at is, here? It is simple, uh, simply a 3D, uh, it's a piece of technology, it's a 3D accelerometer. So in all three dimensions, it registers pretty accurately how much you move around. How much you move around. It's registering your movement. And, uh, is, is it registering how many calories you burn, therefore? Then it tells you how much calories you've burned, yes. At the end of the day, it tells me this is well, I did my fair due of movement <laughs> during the day. And it's, it's just, it's a small business, but it, uh, it's right in the middle of uh, the focus that we've chosen for ourselves, health and well-being. Um, and increasingly, we see that, uh, that for people, well-being uh, means living a healthy, fulfilled life, and we try to support it. And you sell lifestyle coaching to support the product. Is that, is that right? Add to support the product. This links to a website. The website oh. gives you the coaching. Uh, but it is uh, uh, one of many propositions in the well-being area that, uh, that we are developing and where we're getting away from um, the old Philips that people yeah. uh, used to know, if you would say Philips, uh, uh, certainly in the U.S., and it was uh, light bulbs and Magnavox TVs. Um, at current, uh, half of our revenue in the U.S. is, is uh, healthcare in a broad sense. Uh, Raghu, Raghu, do people in India want these things? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> uh, they move enough. <laughs> <laughs> they move enough. Uh, but but uh, I would say that, uh, uh, you know, crises typically, if you look at history, are punctuation points around large technological changes. And I think typically the period following a crisis is when we stabilize and we take advantage of all the technology that has been pent up. And so I think that's an optimistic view of the next two, three decades. We have actually two big changes in the world. One is technology, which has been building up. And the second is we have large emerging markets, India, China, Brazil, coming into the mainstream of the world economy. I think this speaks very well of the prospects for the world economy if we can harness these forces appropriately. And I think the financial crisis allows us to step back, look at what happened, and take a sober but, but you know, positive view. And if we can do it right, I think we will, we will have a very good future. The danger, of course, is we mess it up in terms of what we do going forward, the regulation, uh, the changes that we put in place, the kinds of social uh, forces that are coming into play, the, uh, the inequality between people, and as we respond ineffectively to this. And if that happens, well, everything's up for grabs. And that's a perfect segue to how we'll start the next segment in just a minute, which is from the perspective of the three continent guests on this panel, how is the Obama administration doing in its policy response to the crisis, and how are other governments in Europe and Asia doing? So we will continue, Brian Lehrer, live from the Aspen Ideas Festival, as we have our intercontinental panel continue on the global economy. Stay with us. sure we'll be able to come back to it, I'll but I will try. Okay, whatever. If you want to weave it into an I'll answer to something else. I'll weave it. I hate to show you through the prime minister. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, uh, <laughs> my view is that uh, some of your demographics are changing uh, quite dramatically. Yes, it keeps changing. Young people. So does the uh, outside of the U.S., older people, uh, aging population in the U.S., in Europe, in Japan, even in China. Okay, 20, 15 seconds, folks. 
but they're in our surgery strong in their health care. <coughs> By the way, Arnie Duncan will not be in this room. That's a taping that will be airing later. Just so you know. Yeah, no, it's, they put it on the line. I just don't know what the Live from the Aspen Ideas Festival in Aspen, Colorado. Brian Lair with you on WNYC. Good morning, everyone, as we continue our intercontinental breakfast out here with guests from three continents to talk about the global economy right now. You can also see our Twitter feed and Flickr photos from Aspen at WNYC.org. Click on Brian Lair Show or follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Our guests... Raghu Rajan, economics advisor to the Prime Minister of India, former chief economist of the IMF, University of Chicago professor. Harard Kleisterly, CEO of Royal Phillips Electronics, the biggest electronics company in Europe. David Wessel, Wall Street Journal economics editor. And Roger Ferguson, president and CEO of the financial services company, TIAA Cref. We'll go back to the members of our audience in just a minute. But let's go down the row here and get briefly how you each think President Obama is dealing with this. He's been getting heat recently for his bank overhaul plans, mostly for not requiring enough change in the risk department, not requiring banks to put enough skin in the game, as the expression goes. But he's also getting heat for too much spending, risking inflation, risking high interest rates, risking government insolvency, even. Um, David Wessel, how's Obama doing? I was hoping you'd start with someone else. <laughs> uh, look, I think that the president inherited an extraordinarily difficult situation. You cannot fault the guy for being unambitious. He's trying to do an awful lot at once. As if saving us from the next Great Depression wasn't sufficient, he's also going to do the once-in-a-lifetime overhaul of energy so we can deal with climate change, financial regulation, and health care. Um, I think that there is there, the, the process seems to be a lot of well-thought ideas. It remains to be seen whether they can be turned into well-thought-out legislation. And so the risk of unintended consequences remains very high. Um, Raghu, how does it look from India or from your kind of international perspective or from Chicago? Well, I, I agree with David. He uh, inherits a very difficult situation. But I think that he has two options. One is succumb to the redistributionist instinct, which is out there. Uh, deal with the high, tax, uh, uh, high debt loads that we will have by raising taxes through the roof and convert the US into a slow growth economy. That's one possibility. Uh, he's choosing the high road, which is increasing uh, the US's capabilities over the next few years by improving healthcare, education, uh, energy and so on, and therefore giving the U.S. a possible chance of regaining the productivity growth, which can help pay for the high debt that the U.S. will emerge from this recession uh, with. Now, obviously, that, that, that uh, whole set of changes he's trying to do is fraught with danger, political risk. Uh, you unfreeze everything, and it refreezes in a bad place. Uh, a place you don't want to go to. Economic risk, risk too. Economic risk, uh, the risk that Congress does what it wants, vested interests have their way, and you emerge with something which is not quite Europe, but much worse off. Harard, how does Obama look from Europe? Uh, pretty good. If I, if I look at, uh, at the world, then, then uh, from, from a European perspective, we see a large stimulus package in the, in the US, large stimulus package in China, uh, hardly a stimulus package in India, and, and some stimulus packages in Europe. But there, there, there are big differences uh, between that. Um, the stimulus packages in the US and in China both have a short-term and a long-term component. Uh, in both economies, there is a lot of money uh, not only being poured in um, to get us through uh, this, the, the depth of the crisis, but also to get to some fundamental changes uh, for the better of the longer term. Uh, in Europe, uh, we mainly uh, plug uh, the, current, uh, the current crisis um, in a way even uh, that might keep us more focused, let me say, on yesterday's economy than, than on tomorrow's economy because it's all very defensive. So from a European perspective, Obama gets good marks. Roger Ferguson. I think I'd broadly agree with the consensus that, uh, that is emerging here. I think Obama does get good marks. Uh, the reality is he had only difficult choices and I think he's chosen the best of those difficult choices. On the other hand, as an investor, uh, which TI Cref is, we obviously have to focus out and try to decide whether or not the investments that are going to come forward are going to do, as Raghu has suggested, lead to non-inflationary growth. But at the same time, we have to protect our participants 
against the small but not negligible, not non-existent probability that inflation might tick mm -hmm. up uh, in a few years from now. So are you placing your bets more on rising inflation or stable inflation? At this stage, we're actually trying to have options is the way I just describe it. We're taking short-term investments, which will roll off in time for us to make longer-term investments once the inflationary perspective uh, becomes clearer. I'm curious, members of our audience, applaud if you think you would rate Obama uh, at least a seven out of 10 on his response to the economy. Le okay, and less than a five. All right, well, pretty good, at least in this uh, very unscientific. This cross section of America here that's, at Aspen. That's right, very unscientific <laughs> sample um, here at Aspen. But again, drawing on the three continents represented here today, will there be a race to the bottom or a race to the top for financial regulation? Because as President Obama considers these new rules for banking in the United States, some uh, in the industry are warning that these rules will chase the risk takers away to less regulated markets in Europe or Asia, and they'll become the bigger seats of innovation and of profit. Um, but Roger, I have a feeling you disagree with that because you talked before about money coming to the United States because of our transparency. So how much are you worried about the risk of too much regulation chasing investment capital away, and how much do you think it's gonna to come to the United States because of new rules making things transparent? I think the reality is there is a risk of a bad outcome as well as a return to the things that work. Uh, right now we have, I would say, an electorate that is quite unhappy with the financial services sector, broadly speaking. Uh, I think the Congress is very interested in getting uh, regulation under control. There is always a risk that the pendulum swings too far. It is therefore very important that responsible voices speak up, argue for the right balance in terms of regulation to avoid uh, undercutting the kind of transparency that's been important and the kind of responsible risk taking that's important. Second point I'd make, Brian, is that we clearly see these developments in the U.S being undertaken in a global context. So the other thing that's happening through the auspices of the G20, for example, which is a group of 20 countries, is a desire to try to align regulation in different ways Harad, to avoid these things. Harad, how does this look from Europe? Yeah, I'd like to say a few things about uh, innovation, uh, and particularly innovation in the financial sector. Innovation for me is uh, successfully doing something new in the market. And um, the innovation in the financial sector uh, as we have to conclude now, has not been successful. Uh, it has been a disaster. It has been temporarily successful for very few people, uh, but it has run down the economy. So this was not good innovation. And, and um, if I look from a perspective of our company, if I introduce a, a new medical device, a new procedure, I have to go through uh, extreme tests. I have to go to the FDA. Uh, I get regulated. And only if proven that the outcome is right, for, in this case, patients, I'm allowed to introduce my innovation. In the financial sector, nobody checked these innovations uh, on the effect that they would have. Uh, and that got us to products that were sold mm. from one financial institution to the other, with neither the seller nor the buyer really understanding what was uh, being uh, transferred. But, but you know, Obama is frustrated with the European government for not stimulating enough along with him on a global basis. Yes, I, I can understand that uh, to some extent. Uh, if you look at, at what really has been done for the economy, uh, the European answer, of course, always is that um, we have our social security system. Uh, so a lot of money goes in at the moment into uh, regulations for temporary working or temporary unemployment, uh, unemployment benefits. Um, and as I said, that, that does not necessarily help us to uh, reinvigorate and, uh, the economy and build tomorrow's economy because it keeps people at work in industries that have uh, structural overcapacity uh, at the expense of the taxpayer. So I can understand some of that criticism. By the way, somebody on our webpage as to where to locate a business says, go ahead and move operations to China and then consider the environment. See if you can get edible food or drinkable water there in 20 to 30 years and good luck with that. Who else has a comment or a question in our audience? We're almost out of time. Uh, we have somebody, where? Uh, okay, right over there, I'm sorry. The microphone is traveling to you as fast as it can. Go, and please be brief. 
Hi, Erwin Jacobs uh, from San Diego. I started two companies, uh, Linkabit and Qualcomm, both here in the U.S., been very successful with those. Innovation has been critical. I will raise one other issue that hasn't been touched on. You've talked about regulation as possibly being a negative. In fact, I can't imagine any other country in the world where we could have had the flexibility, the freedom to be able to innovate products, CDMA technology for cell phones, uh, new TV system, et cetera, uh, that we've had here in the U.S. because of support from the regulatory agencies. Thank you very much. All right, we have a minute and a half. What's the elephant in the room? What's the 800-pound gorilla sitting here that nobody's thought to address? Anyone have one? David Wessel? Roger touched on this, but I think it's very important. We will not survive as a society if a huge chunk of people are left out. And we have been through a period of time where the, why, the gap between winners and losers in our society has widened, and we haven't yet found a way to reduce that. If it continues to widen, I think it will be very hard to have the kind of prosperous society that everybody in this room probably wants. Roger Ferguson on that. Very briefly, the issue that has not come up here is the important demographic change that we see in America. Aging population, baby boomers starting to retire into a very uncertain world, issues around health care emerging, and you add to that uncertainty about the safety net that we do have, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. And we're going to do follow-up shows on both of these things, whole full segments. Rado? The key to the uh, issue, which I think is the central one that David Vessel pointed out, is access. And uh, this is where I think innovation helps. Uh, I, I don't think unbridled innovation, but careful, moderately regulated innovation could help in broadening access to education, to health care, but also to financial services, which I think is wo woefully underserved in the United States in certain areas of the, certain sections of the economy. So I think we need to work this out over the next few years. And if we can do it right, I think the future is bright. Harar, 20 seconds if you want it. Well, I, I fully agree that, that innovation is, is the way out of the crisis. Um, uh, that's why, why we address uh, with our healthcare proposition an aging population. Uh, home healthcare is going to be an important topic. Uh, if healthcare costs uh, in the U.S. consume 17% of GDP, then we need technology to help. As somebody said, uh, 20 years from now, uh, with chronic illnesses, half of the American population will be ill and the other half will be needed to serve them uh, if we maintain the current system. So the only way out is technology. All right. We had assistance from Sean Ryan, Jenny Lawton and David Krasnow on loan from Studio 360, in addition to our usual Brian Lehrer Show team. Thanks also to Jeff Lazat and Daniel Nelson at CAV and Bill Hayden and Dave Prosser at Aspen Meadows, and to everyone at the Aspen Institute who helped make this possible. We have another hour from Aspen coming right up, starting with U.S. Education Secretary Arnie Duncan. Thanks to all of you and our audience, and please thank our guests. <laughs>